Um, well, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. It, here it's uh, about uh, quarter past midnight in Australia. Um, and so uh, I'm sure people around the world are at different time zones. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is a case study that we've been doing in Australia on TR4 diagnostics. And this is part of a much bigger project that we're doing on the development of resistant cultivars. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have a field trial site up in, in uh, near Darwin in the Northern Territory in Australia. It's um, a large commercial plantation area. Uh, TR4 has been uh, in the area probably for around about 20 years. This particular plantation uh, was established over 10 years ago and very quickly TR4 became established there. So it has a very high level of uh, endemic uh, TR4 in the soil. So where our field trial site is, is it previously was uh, a commercial planting of Cavendish uh, and is now adjacent um, to those commercial plantings. The, the important thing is that we have a complete history of every plant in that trial. Uh, and all of the infections uh, that we record from uh, a visual inspection are confirmed by PCR and in most instances by sequencing, and I'll go into that at a later time. Um, invariable, uh, invariably, we, we do sequencing, as I say. Uh, this trial is providing a huge amount of very, very important data on the rate of infection, the rate of movement around a field, the spread, um, also the recovery phenotype that we see and we've got uh, a large collection of samples from that site already. Next slide, please. So this is where the site is at a place called Lambles Lagoon. So I'm at uh, Queensland University of Technology, which is in Brisbane in Australia. Uh, that's a subtropical environment where the field trial is at Lambles Lagoon is a, is a tropical environment uh, right up on the in the in the tip of Australia. That's um, that's about two and a half thousand kilometres between uh, QUT and our field trial. So um, we, we regularly uh, visit there. We go there probably around about once a month. Next slide, please. Um, there we are. Yeah. Oh, we're missing. Can we go back? Go back. Back. Oops, we're going ahead. Back. There we are. Thank you. Um, go back one more. Okay, now we should go forward from there. Okay, so it's a, it's a, as you'll see from this slide, uh, it's a very large field trial. Um, it was established in March 2018 and it continues today. The uh, results uh, we've taken so far um, uh, are up to uh, presenting today up to the end of March 2021. So that's uh, three years after the initial planting. Next slide, please. Okay, this is an aerial view of the uh, of the field trial site. It's a four hectare, ten acre site, as you'll see there, uh, with a, a banana commercial banana planting right next door. Uh, this is just before we planted that site. Uh, we have. Uh, large screen houses there where we can do two things. One is that we can uh, acclimatize plants we take up, but also we can do small plant studies in those screen houses again. We have a small office area and we've got a lab on site as well. This is quite a remote site. So we've got a small lab there that we can uh, conduct relatively simple experimentation, particularly around DNA diagnostics, but we can also isolate, um, uh, isolate TR4 uh, from soil or plant samples there as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a trial which involves our genetically modified uh, Cavendish lines. Um, as I say, the trial will run over a period of five years. It's a randomized block design um, planted in March, 2018. So we've got two controls, um, both, uh, both Cavendish, Grand Nain and Williams. And then we've got four genetically modified lines. We had a previous field trial with these same four lines and these are in Grand Nain. 
Um, and one of those lines in that first trial uh, appeared to be um, immune to TR4 over, again over a three year period and uh, three other lines with very, very high levels of resistance. So uh, this trial has those same four lines. The results that we got are essentially identical to the phase one trial, but on a much, much larger scale. And for this trial, we're collecting most of the agronomic data as well as the disease resistance data, including yield cycle time. And as I said, we have this complete history of every plant in the trial over a three year period. Uh, and, and at the moment, we're just preparing a, a publication over those first three years of that trial. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you an idea, these are some of the non-GM. So these are some of the wild type plants in that field trial, very, very typical symptoms, uh, yelling, yellowing of leaves. And when you, uh, when you cut open the, the shooter stem, uh, areas of significant vascular discoloration, visually high levels of vascular necrosis. Next slide, please. Okay, our diagnostic approach. So our diagnostic approach is all based on um, the six genes, the secreted in xylem genes, which encode small proteins. Um, and all of these genes are based, uh, are located on the FOC pathogenicity chromosome. Um, so when you, uh, when you go in sequence and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, uh, tropical race four, subtropical race four or race one, uh, they all have these six genes, but they have different six genes. And that's very important. Uh, for instance, in TR4, there is one, um, uh, there are three sequences of six one, one se sequence of six thirteen, et cetera. Uh, and you can differentiate uh, TR4, STR4, and RACE1 depending on the six genes and the sequences of those six genes that they have um, uh, in the, on their chromosome number 13, the pathogenistic chromosome. So what we've done is we've completely sequenced our, um, our TR4 isolate from the Dar Darwin field as well as local isolates, Australian isolates of subtropical race four and a number of race one isolates as well. So we've got a very good uh, sequence database uh, and we've also got uh, gen band sequences. And from these sequences, we've designed our diagnostic primer sets. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so all of, the, all of the plants that have symptoms are screened by PCR. So this is, this is quite important. Um, so what we do is we've got a, a, a set of six um, primer sequences and they're all uh, six one gene sequences and they're all unique. So we've got three for uh, tropical race four, TR4. We've got one for subtropical race four and one for uh, race one, as I said, all from the six one gene. Uh, and what we do is, and, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in a moment, uh, we extract uh, DNA on site, and then we transport that, that uh, DNA to our labs in, in Brisbane. Um, we do PCR uh, on those, not multiplex PCR. We, we do each of those PCRs in a separate tube. Um, and then we normally uh, sequence by Sanger sequencing, either the PCR product directly, or we clone and then sequence that PCR product. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, this is actually how we do it on site and back at, back at the lab. Uh, so wherever we have an inf infected or a suspected infected plant, and we also from time to time have, take healthy banana plants at our, our Darwin fruit farm, uh, field trial site. Um, we, as I said, we have a small lab there where we isolate genomic DNA. So what we do is we always collect um, tissue from the vascular necrosis areas within the shooter stem, and I'll certainly talk about that in a moment. Um, so that's the tissue that we, we, we collect. Um, we use uh, DNA zoles and liquid nitrogen. It's one step method. Um, and we only need ethanol and no fume hood. And that's quite important because we don't have a fume hood up in, uh, in, our, small, in, in our small Darwin lab. Uh, so this, um, 
methodology is particularly designed so we can take samples at, at remote locations and where we don't need very sophisticated um, uh, facilities to be able to do that. Uh, so we dry those, those DNA pellets on site and then fly them back to Brisbane. Uh, we do uh, PCR there with a, with a um, user housekeeping gene. Um, or we always use the three TR461 gene sequences, the PCR for those, and uh, randomly do STR4 and race one amplifications as well, just to make sure that we're not picking up anything else. Um, these are then um, electrophoresis through agarose. Uh, we cut out and purify those bands and send those off for Sanger sequencing. We can either do that within our own facilities at QUT, or uh, we can also do it uh, with external labs. Um, we use we use Genius as our uh, as our um, uh, gene comparison software. So we import those sequences into Genius, and we can do analysis, um, basically using our long read assembly of um, of TR4. We can also use next gen sequencing um, and comparisons with known TR4 um, sequence assemblies of, of, of those published. Okay, so what I thought would be useful is to go through some of the results that we're getting, and you'll see over the next uh, group of slides the sorts of results we're getting. And I think this is quite important. We, we see lots of um, lots of examples in the, in the literature about the sorts of results people are getting. These are the results that we're getting, and this is in a field trial where we know the history of every plant. Okay, so this is a very early stage infection. Uh, this is where you see just one leaf showing uh, some symptoms. And this is um, very, very common in our, in our trial. Next slide, please. So what, you, what happens when you cut that, uh, cut that plant down, the pseudostem, and you'll see at the base of the pseudostem, so we'll go all the way up the pseudostem taking samples. At the base of the pseudostem, even at that very, very early stage, you see very significant vascular discoloration. And as you go up uh, mid stem, and you'll see right there in the, in the center of that, you'll still get some flex of, of vascular discoloration and even right up towards the top of that scooter stem. So this is even in, in very, very early infections, you get, you get that vascular necrosis right up through the scooter stem, but you do not see, or we don't see any necrosis in the peduncle and we don't see any necrosis uh, in the fruit. So next slide, please. So the results from that, we get uh, our PCR positive in the base, uh, PCR positive mid shooter stem and PCR positive at the top of the shooter stem, but we do not get PCR positives from either the peduncle or from the fruit. So that's an important result. And we've repeated this many, many times. Okay, so here's a plant. This is this is mid stage. This has a number of leaves already showing symptoms, um, and so it's it's a mid stage infection. It's still standing, um, and so when we go and take the pseudo stem from that plant, next slide, please. Uh, we'll see that there's significantly more vascular discolor discoloration. So we're getting a lot of vascular discoloration then in that base. Um, we've seen it very, very obviously uh, in the in, in the mid shooter stem region and also in the top shooter stem region. If you look at the peduncle very carefully, whoops, go back, yeah, jumping the gun there. <laughs> uh, if you look at the peduncle region, sometimes we see little flecks of necrosis. And we always take those and we and, and very carefully see whether they are, um, have any, any uh, fusarium fungus present. Next slide, please. However, in all of the, the uh, uh, mid, mid uh, infections, we get obviously PCR positives at the base, the mid and the top. But again, we don't see any fungal evidence in the peduncle and certainly not in the fruit. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is a late stage infection. So this is very close to the, the final moments of that banana. Uh, and we have certainly a lot of those in our, um, 
in our control plants. I should say our control plants now after three years, we're getting up to close to 80% infection. Um, next slide, please. Here we have very, very extensive um, shooter stem vascular necrosis at the base. It really is pretty well going rotten. And uh, when, we, when we look, there are other, there are other um, uh, often saprophytes in there as well as, as fusarium. In that mid stem region, um, very, uh, very significant vascular necrosis, even right up at the top. Again, in the peduncle, we see sometimes these little, little necrotic flecks, but they are just necrotic flecks and we don't see anything in the fruit. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and again, so obviously positive at the base, positive in, in mid uh, shooter stem and positive in the top of the plant. Never do we find uh, fusarium up in the, in the peduncle and we never find fusarium <coughs> in the fruit. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, some take home messages from, from, from our experience. This field trial site has been a fabulous field trial site for us to develop and validate diagnostics and diagnostic protocols. So what we did uh, over the, and we had a previous, I should say we had a previous field trial to this, a much smaller one. And we tried a range of uh, primer sets, some of which, or many of which have been published. Uh, and it was using that, that, that first field trial that we came up um, with the primer sets that we've developed. And, we, and, and that's been really a great opportunity uh, at that field trial site to both validate those diagnostics and the diagnostic protocols. And we've been specifically doing that so that the sorts of protocols we've been developing can be used uh, at remote sites like at, at this field trial site. Um, the primer sets we use uh, on the unique 6-1 genes uh, and they've turned out to be very robust and highly reproducible results. We're, we're pretty careful. So what we do is we tend to sequence the PCR products um, and we think this is highly, highly desirable and essential, I would say, for any new incursion verification. Um, and that can be done, you know, in, in, in our case, we can, we've had, we have, in-house uh, capability for doing Sanger sequencing and, and Illumina and, um, uh, and PacBio sequencing. But from time to time, we also send that off to other laboratories uh, to make sure that we're getting the same sorts of results, if, whether we do them in-house or we send them overseas. I think one of the important things uh, that we've found is to sacrifice the plant that you're collecting tissue from because of that very, very early stage of uh, infection, the vascular discoloration can be um, very unevenly distributed across the, the, the pseudostem. stem. And if we take, and I hadn't, didn't show those results, but I could have, if we take the non-vascular discolorated tissue, the tissue that looks quite healthy, very often we do a PCR product always get a PCR product from that vascular discolorated area. So um, we always sacrifice the plant to make sure that we collect that vascular disc discolored tissue um, to ensure that we're, um, we're, we're collecting tissue that is, has been invaded. Um, I should say that we've now done literally hundreds of, of PCR diagnostic tests from samples that are at, at Darwin Fruit Farm. Um, and these are, these are all field samples. So these are a, 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 pretty, um, a pretty good uh, example of how we can test for, for TR4 in the field. Um, so very importantly, we have not identified TR4 in the peduncle of even very, very advanced TR4 infections. So that, that briefly is the, um, is the diagnostic protocols and our experience from, from our uh, Darwin Fruit Farm. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got a, a large group of, of researchers involved in this. Um, this is primarily um, a, a project to develop 
um, uh, genetically modified and gene edited Cavendish with resistance to TR4, but a, a very good side project out of that has been um, has has been the development of the diagnostics, and we've had really very uh, very very good support uh, funding support over the years. So thank you, Victor and Nelson. That's my presentation. Oh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Dale, for your presentation. Um, I I I take a few points away from your presentation, which of course we'll speak about a little later. Um, we are already beyond in our, um, in our agenda and our time. So we'd move on to the other um, presenter, Dr. Yolan. And I wonder before we I give her the floor, um, very interestingly that your research should show that um, the infection could exist in the stem, in the pseudostem, and not in the peduncle and the fruits. So this is an important take home and um, thank you for that. Um, I'll give the floor right now to Dr. Yolan Schilling Charles Sirad um, as she will expand on her presentation. Thank you very much. Remember, just a reminder that the presentations are, are 10 minutes long um, and we will take a few questions later on. The floor is yours, Yolan. Okay, all right. Thank you, Nelson. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, in the following presentation, I'm going to develop the methodology proposed by CRAD to diagnose uh, 4TA4, in the, particularly in the French overseas territories, because we will see uh, the official process which has been validated by the plant protection services in, of the French Ministry of Agriculture. Next slide, please. The four steps we can see in this process are common to all diagnosis processes. And the first uh, three steps in the field are very, I will tell that is, they are very important to do a quick and a good diagnosis. Because we know that even if we have good molecular tools, if the samples are bad, we couldn't do a correct diagnosis. Next slide, please. In the French territory, of the sea territories, we have four uh, principal actors in the monitoring. The producers and the technician, the plant protection services and delegates. The first one are monitoring the presence of the disease in the, on the field and they send the photo symptoms to the second. And now at CIRAD, we are actually developing an Android software uh, and this tool will help the plant protection services uh, shorting the data sent by the producers and the technician, and they can plan the sampling if it is necessary. Next slide, please. Thank you. Two steps in the identification of FOC TA4 in the field. First, the producers and the technician uh, using the flyers to uh, do to do a good identification for the external symptoms only. And they can, during this time, they have to secure the area and inform the plant protection services as they are not allowed in France to do the windows in the pseudosterm to observe the internal symptoms. Next slide, please. Thank you, Matt. The sampling is operate especially uh, the slide before. Okay, right. Oh. Oh, I've got it. No problem. The sampling is operated especially by the, uh, the plant protection services or delegates. And the numbers of uh, technicians are limited of two persons to avoid the risk of 
uh, dispersal. The only sampling techniques we use, either one shown by Dr. Perez Vicente during the first FAO workshop in Trinidad. The pseudostem samples are dried before sending to the reference laboratory in France. Next slide, please. Okay, so since the, the identification of the symptoms by the grower and the technician, it is necessary to put the contingency action in place because the following steps in the laboratory will need time, enough time for the dispersal of the disease if the area is not secured. Next slide, please. For the French overseas territories, the diagnosis is operated by ANSYS, which is the reference laboratory. The first steps for ANSYS is the confirmation of the presence of fog in the samples by the isolation and the morphology identification of fog strains. Next, please. The second step is the real-time PCA assay developed by Agayo and I in 2017 using plant uh, samples. This test is the, the formal one. Next, please. But Sirad, uh, will propose soon at the, the beginning of the next year, another uh, molecular test based on the loop mediated isothermal amplification. What? Especially to practice a first diagnostic in a short time in the field and do an early detection of the disease on plant which have few symptoms. Next, please. The pathogenicity essay are the third step of the process. They respond to Cox postulate. They confirm that the strains isolate are in cause of the symptoms. For this essay, we use a solid inoculum, which, which, which is millet uh, seeds inoculate with a conidia suspension. The solid inoculate inoculum mainly contains chlamydospore. And the banana plantlet used are two months age old. Next, please. The ultimate step of the diagnosis in the laboratory for us is the VCG test. In this test, the formation of heterokaryon obtained with net mutant of universal 40A4 strains confirm that the, diag the diagnostic of VCG 1230-1216. Next, please. As you understood, the methodology chosen to diagnose 40A4 in the French of a city stories is a partnership process in which each partner brings its experience and his expertise in the different step of the diagnosis. Next, please. If we have uh, a global look on the different steps and the advantages of and the challenges of the those steps. We can say that the participation of the producers are very important, more eyes to survey. And the, the Android software, it's a good uh, really advantage to give us a quick response and to collect the data on the, uh, on the on, on symptom disease, uh, the symptoms, but also on um, the geographic uh, localization of the disease. The challenge we have now 
is to is to increase number of observation and finalize the web software. On the identification step, we have now a good samples database to help uh, the um, plant protection services. But we have to improve the public information to reduce the risk of spreading the disease. Sample, the sampling is easy and safe because few persons are allowed to do it. But in the future, we would like to improve the FTA cards did by uh, Sigma because these cards uh, uh, can allow the safe delivery of samples between different laboratories. Uh, on the diagnosis, uh, we, we, we can say that now is quite safe uh, because we have both molecular tests and pathogenic tests. It can be rapid, quick, with the first diagnostic on the field with the lump assay. And uh, for the few months in the future, we have to finalize the lump assay on soil and water to use it for the survey. The next, please. And I would like to end my presentation on this poster did by the Plant Protection Services of Guadeloupe to inform banana plantation workers on the air force symptoms. Uh, and I will tell, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Yolande, for your presentation. Um, of course, you, you said something which is um, important. Um, everything was important, but stood out to me. Um, it says more eyes for service. So diagnostics goes hand in hand with service. Thank you for that. Um, I will just inform the group that the Q&A tab is active. You could place your questions in there and the panelists will be able to answer your questions. There are a few questions already for Dr. Dale and Dr. Yoland. Um, and we will currently, we will skip a bit the, the question and answer session so we could gain some time. Of course, we have four more panelists to go um, we'll gain some time and then we will, if we have enough time, then we'll have this interaction, this verbal interaction between yourselves and the panelists. So right now we'll just go on to Dr. Diane Monstert from Stellenbosch University who will be presenting to us today. Thank you very much. You have the floor, Dr. Monstert. Hi, good, good afternoon here in South Africa. Uh, can you guys see me and hear me fine? You are, you are loud and clear. Um, yes. Great. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to present today. It's a great honor to me to present to this group. Um, and I will be talking about how we characterize FOC um, at Stellenbosch University. Um, and I will refer to FOC, of course, um, it's the Physerum oxysporum formis specialis, um, Kibane's fungus. Um, that we all know and that, that is causing all the problems all around. So if we move to the next slide, please. So in the interest of time, I will jump right into it and explain the process we follow here to diagnose um, FOC samples. And I will make the hypothesis that we are dealing with a situation where there is a possible new incursion of FOC TR4. So we also um, obviously characterize some other strains. So I'll focus this, this presentation mostly on FOC TR4. So usually when we, when we start our process, we, we get a piece of infected dry plant material. And I think Yolanda has shown, shown that as well in her presentation that we usually request from, from someone to send 
um, to us by courier. Um, and depending on how urgent the answer is, and usually it is very urgent, we will do an initial extraction directly from the plant material and run a qPCR, which can give us an answer within a day of receiving a sample. And this technique obviously has the advantage that you can do it very fast and it's very sensitive and you can directly extract from the envi environmental material. However, it is um, it can be quite expensive and you need quite specialized skill to do qPCR. And there's always a risk if you are um, doing your detection directly from environmental materials that you can detect um, false positives. So the Q and QC PCR, just like other PCRs, is usually based on a single gene. Um, so, so that can also be kind of a negative. And, it, and if you did not sample um, correctly, a negative answer might be due to your sampling bias rather than the sampling actually not harboring FOCTR4. So therefore, we will always go ahead and um, isolate and purify our samples. And once we have a purified sample, then we will store it in our culture collection so that we can go back to that sample if anything goes wrong in the diagnostic um, process. We will extract the DNA and then we'll, we can do whatever downstream application we want to do with that. That could include obviously PCR or gene sequencing or VCG testing or pathogenicity, depending on who is the person that we are doing this test for. Um, if we are dealing with a new incursion, like I said before, we will use different types of conventional PCRs that are available so that we are sure um, that we are confirming um, this FOCTR4 ID correctly. So purification, um, purification and subsequent PCR analysis have the advantage that it's affordable and that most labs have PCR machines. So I think um, uh, Professor Dale has also touched on that. You want an uh, assay that you can that can be widely applied. So that is very important. And of course, if if someone is skilled, they can do their um, first analysis, the isolation and DNA extraction themselves, and then send the DNA over to our lab. Um, and that obviously um, poses less of a quarantine risk, so you don't have to move around this infected plant materials. Um, again, like I said, with the qPCRs, because single-plex PCRs are based on, on, on our single gene regions, there's still possibilities that false po positives can be picked up, and I will elaborate on that in the next slide. Uh, we will sometimes also support our diagnosis with reference gene sequencing, and we have an in-base um, gene database, um, which we will then use to draw up a phylogenetic tree. And the power of gene sequencing, of course, is that you can compare your sample to public databases, which is a good, uh, very good um, pro of this. It is, however, expensive and you need specialized skill to interpret the data. Um, and your sequencing of your reference genes, um, this is an important point, can also not always distinguish between very closely related FOC VCGs. And here I can make an example of two of the VCGs, the, the one that's related to tropical race 4, which is the 12, 13, 16, and 0, 1 to 1, having identical sequences for, for the TEF region that is used very often to identify Fusarium oxysporum um, species, but they can actually have very different virulence levels. So this is why we confirm our um, FOC um, IDs that we have with our molecular studies always with VCG testing. And although this, this is quite timely, um, we have a lot of confidence that once we, we have ID'd something with VCG testing and we combine that with molecular analysis, that it's very accurate. Um, unfortunately, it has the, the added cons that it takes quite um, some skill to do this test and you need the standard test, which is fungal material, which might, might pose also a quarantine risk. And ultimately, um, we also would confirm a new incursion um, by doing 
um, pathogenicity testing on Cavendish um, to complete Koch's postulates. And this is really the only a, a reliable way that you um, can currently confirm the virulence of a sample. However, just doing pathogenicity testing alone is not enough as you can't distinguish closely related FOC VCGs and that sometimes samples within a VCG will have different um, responses when you do the pathogenicity testing. Furthermore, of course, it, it poses a quarantine risk and you need specialized skill and access to plant material to conduct this. So we go through this whole process and we make very, very sure um, before we put the data out there. Um, and once we've done all of this test, then we can confidently say, okay, cool. We, we do have um, FOCTR4 or we don't. So next slide, please. Okay, as I mentioned before, we always um, also um, carefully consider molecular markers that we are using to diagnose FOC. And we come from a standpoint that molecular markers are not absolutely reliable. And, and this was highlighted in the work by Magdama et al, who's also in the audience today, who showed that some of the popular molecular markers were amplifying some non-pathogenic endophytes. The problem is that when you're validating a molecular marker, you cannot test all of the, the species that you're going to encounter out there. So, so this, why this picked up on, on, um, on this assays is because the sequences that were used to design these markers had high homology between your true and false positive samples. And this is often the case when molecular markers are designed from genes that have ha housekeeping functions. Uh, from this paper, they basically concluded that diagnostic markers in, in the study of Lee et al. there on your left-hand corner and colleagues were the most reliable. And this genetic locus um, was then used um, also to, and they, they think that this genetic locus is, is linked to virulence. And, and since other approaches um, have also considered the six genes, and I think um, Professor Dale has um, elaborated on that quite a bit. Um, important, like I, I think also Yolanda mentioned that we work together with, with CIRAD to, um, or ANSYS actually to develop a, um, a qPCR assay that was based actually on the genetic locus in that paper by Lee and colleagues. Um, and we know this is very accurate and it's been very well validated, but it does pick up two of the closely related VCGs. So this prompted us to design our own qPCR assay that only um, pick up the VCG 1316. And we validated this um, on different environmental samples. So we looked at, can we detect it from water, soil, and plant material? Um, and, and this is the qPCR assay that we are using currently um, that's listed there in that paper. So, but when we are dealing with a new incursion, we would often use two or three different molecular um, markers um, designed from different genetic loci so that we have more confidence that our answer is correct. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, I will go quickly through the next session, but it's just that um, I want to kind of cement in that there's important considerations when you're using particular diagnostic tools. So I will quickly discuss the following questions that you see on your screen now. Um, and this is the things that we consider when we are conducting diagnosis. Um, and this will be relevant to anyone out there in the audience today when you are considering which tool to use and, and how to go about it. Next slide, please. Okay, so to answer the first question, what capacity and budget do we have available? So at Stellenbosch, obviously we can do almost everything, but you have to consider your situation or, um, with what you have available. So for molecular diagnostics, we can do PCR, qPCR, we have a sequencing unit that where we can do reference gene sequencing and whole genome sequencing. For phenotyping, we can do uh, we have um, we can do morphological identifications. Uh, we can we also do obviously VCG testing. And one of the, the advantages that we have is that we have a characterized population um, that is accurately 
characterized from all over the world, um, which we can do to co compare um, and do comparative population studies. We also have a tissue culturing facility and we have optimized techniques to screen different varieties for pathogenicity or resistance against different um, FOC VCGs. And, and we have highly skilled, dedicated personnel that can conduct each of these analyses. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, and now two very important things that we consider is firstly, um, when we get a sample, where was, where was it isolated from? And what is the history of um, the disease in that region? So we know, for example, if we look at that, that map of Africa, that's where a lot of our activities are. Um, we know that one, there's a group of closely related BCGs in a single um, phylogenetic lineage that we call lineage six that dominate um, whenever we're doing surveillance out in the Central and East African uh, regions, we always get this group of VCGs that cluster in that lineage. And this have prompted us to kind of optimize a multiplex PCR tool to rapidly identify this lineage. We also consider the, the variety that we isolate from. So of course, when we see disease on Cavendish in the tropics, we are immediately considering, okay, it could be FOCTR4 and we will start our diagnostic process there. However, if we get a sample from um, South Africa, um, that's a Cavendish that's infected from South Africa, it would more, more likely actually be STR4 uh, or um, if you look at that picture on the left, that's a, a Blago type of banana. Um, we took that in northern Mozambique, so close to where, where the FOCTR4 incursion was. There it could actually be any of the races. So this kind of like guides the process on how we, we go about our diagnostics. Okay, next slide, please. The last point um, that I want to make is that you should consider your situation very carefully before you spend a lot of resources on expensive um, tools, diagnostic tools. And I'm saying this because the first step really is the most important is that role players are able to recognize the disease accurately in the field. And that's, that's your first line of defense. And we know when a Cavendish shows, shows typical FOC symptoms under tropical climatic conditions, we might have a problem. And from that point, you can already start your containment protocols. So when the symptoms show on a plant, it also means that the disease might have been there quite a while already. So now do we need to confirm our suspect plant within 30 minutes? Um, well, that would be very convenient, of course. But the most important is that we accurately identify the sample because um, rather than causing panic if we, we haven't confirmed it very accurately. And I will make an example of this diagnostic that was recently marketed to the community. We don't know how accurate this is, um, as it wasn't published in a peer review article. With this, I'm not saying that it's not accurate, and, and obviously it can be used, but just that we don't know. And even though they are claiming that they can very rapidly ID FOCTR4, it's worth to spend our resources, is it worth that we, we spend all our researchers on buying these um, expensive machines that we need to do this assay? Or can we just rather use our PCR machines at our research institutions? So what I'm saying with this is look at your situation. What is your budget? What type of skills do you have avail available? And then decide which tool is the most appropriate to your situation. And with that, um, you can go on to the next slide. I would just want to say thank you for some of the funding bodies and collaborators that we've been working on in recent projects on diagnostics and um, studying the populations of FOC worldwide. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity again. Very good. Thank you very much um, from South Africa. Um, Diane Monset, thank you for your presentation and sharing with us the experience in South Africa at Stellenbosch University. Um, we will go directly now to Dr. Gert Kramer from Morgan England University. 
and, and research. And he will present to us their, um, their methodologies and he will do his presentation now. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Dr. Kemmer. Thank you. Can you hear me, uh, Nelson? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, welcome everybody and uh, around the world, so to say. Uh, so here it's now at five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and I also would like to congratulate the World Banana Forum for your uh, plus 10 years anniversary. And uh, I was one of the inaugural members. And I still remember I was actually correcting uh, during the first meeting, our first paper on the molecular diagnostic for tr 4 that we developed. So that was published in 2010. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Well, here you see the internal symptoms that have also been shown by the previous uh, speakers. And I, of course, like to uh, thank them for introducing various aspects of TR4 diagnostics. Uh, but what you can see in the left panel is those vascular strands and also in the right panel, those are the ones that are really dark, but also the faint and yellow ones. Those are the uh, vascular strands that we usually receive, as also mentioned by one of the previous speakers, uh, which had been dried at room temperature, and then these are processed in our lab. Very similar to what has been discussed already by all the previous speakers, so I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, of course, what is very important is, number one, is speed, and that has to do with new incursions, and it's always being validated by inoculations of plants in our greenhouse uh, facilities at Wageningen University, to indeed complete box uh, postulates. And I have to say, we actually have abandoned VCG testing because we sequence all the strains that we receive. Uh, so for our, from our perspective, sequencing has really replaced uh, VCG testing. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. And as you, uh, th this is a kind of the distribution over the years of uh, TR4 and the dissemination of TR4 around the globe. So to make a long story short, um, in, in most of the green dots that you see, the diagnostic that we developed and published in 2010, and that was a collaborative effort with uh, Dr. Miguel Dita, who will speak later, who was a visiting scientist in my lab in those day, in those years. Um, and that's when we started to work on fusarium and our first target was to develop a molecular diagnostic simply to have speed because until then, TO4 diagnostics was entirely based on VCG testing. And it's also been mentioned by uh, Dr. Mostert and others that really take several weeks uh, and sometimes even months. And for the management of a disease, you need accurate diagnostics to act quickly. And, you know, we see that now happening around the world, of course, also with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And there you also see that the various tools that we have developed and that have been discussed also during this webinar are very important to diagnose and to manage. And that's exactly the same for TR4 and banana. So you see one red uh, year, 2014, more or less in the middle of the screen. And that was when we used our diagnostic for the first time, um, or when we actually diagnosed TR4 for the first time outside Southeast Asia. And that was in Jordan. And since then it has shown up in various other regions of the world, as you can see, and has also been mentioned by the other uh, speakers. And in most of those um, incursions after 2014, the diagnostic that we developed has been used to confirm quickly, as yes, indeed this is TR4. And so uh, the speed of testing is of course very important, that of course it needs to be accurate, that's very clear, and I come back to that in, uh, in one of the next slides. So maybe we can go to the next slide. This is important, I think, because we decided upon uh, publishing our diagnostic in 2010 uh, to actually start working with a commercial company in the Netherlands to commercialize the TR4 diagnostic. Uh, because we have experienced that uh, once people start using the protocols that we publish in scientific papers, and that's what we have experienced in various labs around the world, they start to modulate the programs that are actually published. So, you know, you can change the temperature or the concentrations. And of course, that is a source of errors. 
So we consider that if you commercialize a diagnostic, uh, you have essentially one fixed protocol. So when you use a diagnostic in Latin America in our lab or in South Africa, it just doesn't make a difference. So you really have data that you can compare globally. So I'm, I'm strongly in favor of commercializing diagnostics. Um, and of course, we do that in collaboration with this company. So we don't have any shares in this company at all. I mean, it's, it's really to make sure that we have these tools uh, available around the world and that everybody is using the same technology and the same procedures. So standardization, essentially. And I believe that is very, very important for comparative reasons. And um, the next slide, I have kind of quickly listed. You can go to the next slide. Yes, I've kind of quickly listed the various protocols or the various, let's say, technologies that are being used so far. So also, as mentioned by the previous speakers, a great majority of the diagnostics is based on PCR. And of course, you can use different targets, different genes on the genome of TR4. So ours uh, that we purchased in 2010 was on the uh, EF1 factor. Um, and then you see the other papers have used different genes like the six genes or other genes uh, to diagnose TR4. And I think that is fantastic because we really have now a panel of targets that we can use and the more different targets you use, of course, the more secure uh, your diagnosis will be. And, and what we have to keep in mind, of course, as well, is that there is not a single diagnostic that will last forever because pathogens populations will change. So you have to update diagnostics frequently. And that's why we have developed, for instance, the LAMP, as you can see in the middle uh, photograph, uh, that LAMP diagnostic is based on another um, uh, target in the fungal genome. So in our hands, in our lab, if we use the diagnostic, the PCR diagnostic, we always run the LAMP in addition so because we know it for sure that we already have two different targets on the same genome. And of course, that is increasing the reliability of your diagnostic. I think eventually we also need to go to lateral flow devices. They are very fast. It's like a self-test that you do for a coronavirus. Um, and I'm sure these type of diagnostics will be available also somewhere in the near future. So in the next slide, I have uh, compared the different technologies that we have available. So you see uh, the methods, so let's say PCR, irrespective of the target gene you're using, lamp and lateral flow devices, then you have the substrates, so plants, water and soil. Of course, water is very important. If you, for instance, if you see in now in Peru with the new incursion of TR4 in Peru, that's an area that is strongly irrigated. So once you have infested soil there, of course, dissemination by water is very, very important to check. And then the last four columns is, let's say, the, the investment you have to do to get such a diagnostic running, uh, training necessary, the speed of the test, and also the throughput. And you really have to look at those different uh, situations which diagnostic is most appropriate. In general, we are very reluctant to test TR4 in soil. We can accurately do it in plant tissue and in water, but soil has a very significant complexity factor already starting with the DNA isol uh, isolation of soil. So I'm not sure whether we really can reliably test, uh, let alone quantify uh, TR4 in soil. We have done it in, with TechMan assays. That's a different approach. Um, uh, so we focus mostly on plant and water, and that's, of course, with new incursions also exactly the, and the, uh, the substrate that we see. Now, if you look in the investment, setting up, setting up a PCR lab is simply expensive. It's in equipment, and it's also in training people, as you see in the next column. A lamp assay is cheaper, and the training you can do essentially in one day. And so you really can train people quickly to use that type of technologies. It's fast. Uh, but as you can see, the throughput is lower. And so a lamp typically is a tool that you use as an alert. Uh, whereas once you have an incursion and you have diagnosed TR4, you need throughput. You need to process many, many samples. And the best way to do that is simply by PCR. Even a lateral flow device, of course, is a, an alert tool 
but you never will use that where you require a high throughput, where you really have to process many, many samples. Uh, so, and then my final slide is, as I mentioned already earlier to you, um, we essentially sequence every strain. And of course, that is very important for new incursions, uh, because you do a first diagnostic, you isolate, you make single spore strains, you inoculate plants to confirm the disease um, under greenhouse conditions. Uh, but in addition to that, and that's what you see here in panel B, we sequence those strains, compare it to reference strains. And once you have the sequence, you are sure, yes, this is TR4. So it's really confirming what you diagnose with diagnostics. But on top of that, it gives you um, the ability to do phylogeography. So you can relate your strain to other strains that have occurred in particular regions. So what you for instance see in panel D here is the incursions of TR4 in Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar were quick, very, very closely associated with TR4 in southern China province of Yunnan. And so there was a very clear connection to the dissemination in the Mekong region from uh, Chinese infested farms. And so I believe that having a closer look at the phylogeography of TR4 is also very important and it brings a level of responsibility to the entire banana sector. And with that, I would like to thank in the next slide our partners and collaborators. And then in the next slide, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team at Phytopathology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kema, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to open the floor now for about three minutes as we, we are we are against time um, because we have two other presenters. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for three minutes to take uh, two questions at least. We already have within the Q&A um, tab, there are questions that were asked and they were answered by the panelists. So we could visit there and, and, and have the responses. Um, I'll take one question from Antoinette. Antoinette, your hand is raised, you have the floor. Antoinette, no? Okay, then we will go to Roderick. Your hands is raised. All right, it appears that um, the hands were raised uh, shy. So uh, let's let's try another person. Um, Hannah Romain, your hand is raised. Your mic is muted. We will revisit this question and answer section at the end of the of the presentations. So without any further delay, we will go on to um, Dr. Dita, who will present his um, his work now. Well, presentation. Go ahead, Dr. Dita, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Um, Nelson, can you hear me? Loud and clear, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, thanks. Next, Mateus. Okay, many thanks uh, for the invitation. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to, to discuss uh, tools and also process. So my talk will be more related to how we link tools with from the field to a official confirmation that we have a new break of the F4. Okay, so I saw the, the, the participants attendees, I see many people who speak Spanish, at least for the name. So probably was wondering if I can switch, if the interpreter not, I mean, if, if you don't mind, I don't know who is translating it, but probably it's better if, if I don't know. Absolutamente, Don Miguel, adelante en español. Gracias, compañero. <laughs> Gracias. Next, please. Okay, um, 
ya, ya esto fue dicho por los demás eh, colegas, los, los, aquí simplemente eh, eh, decirles un poco que, que, que una cosa son las herramientas y las otras cosas cómo integras esas herramientas dentro de un flujo de diagnóstico en un laboratorio oficial y luego cómo lo pones todo dentro de un marco legal que difiere de acuerdo a los países. Próximo, por favor. Ok, las tecnologías ayudan muchísimo, ¿sí? Y yo he puesto esta comparación aquí un poquito para ver. Eh, pero cuando una, 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 una Organización Nacional de Protección Fitosanitaria eh, dice que Raza 4 está presente, ya, ya, ya está presente, o sea, los métodos, los protocolos deben seguir, los procesos deben seguir un análisis integrado para que sea un equívoco, para que sea claro, robusto y siempre basado en principios científicos. Tú puedes decir, es raza cuadro tropical, ya lo, lo voy a ver después, basado en BCG, puedes decir, es, es raza cuadro tropical basado en BCG y en una PCR, como fue fecho hasta el 2010, pues, o puede decir, sí, es raza cuadro tropical basado en BCG, gracias, en dos, tres PCR y también en secuenciamiento. Pero al final de cuentas, cuando dices que es raza cuadro tropical, ya eso tiene otras implicaciones a nivel oficial. Próximo. Ok, y para llegar a ese nivel, ya Diane o también Yolanda, creo que mis eh, colegas anteriores lo, lo han dicho, lo primero es conocer de una manera clara los síntomas de la enfermedad y discriminarlos con los complejos que vemos en campo. Es importante que se está haciendo un monitoramiento para Fusario, pero recuerden que en campo hay otros, o hay otros patosistemas, inclusive complejos. Próximo. Por ejemplo, este. Este es un, un, tipo, un típico síntoma donde hay y confusión muchas veces en campo y los que están muestreando muchas veces no saben muy bien lo que hay patógenos asociados. Entonces, eh, simplemente para resaltar lo que habían dicho mis colegas, la, el reconocimiento de síntomas en campo es, es fundamental porque al final de cuentas estamos haciendo un diagnóstico para tomar decisiones en campo. Luego, nuevamente, recuerden que mi, mi presentación está un poco más basada en la parte oficial, en las implicaciones que tiene una nueva a un nuevo brote raspado tropical. Próximo. El segundo es muestreo. Hay diferentes protocolos. El plan de contingencia de lo IRSA lo dice claramente, los colegas lo, lo, lo mencionaron, pero recuerden que ni siempre esto está muy claro y que hay que llegar a las personas que hacen ese muestreo, que de manera preferencial deben ser las organizaciones de protección fitosanitaria las únicas autorizadas a colectar una muestra sospechosa de raza cuadro tropical. Tres, el next. Tercero, parece o puede parecer trivial, pero no. Es importante que ese proceso o, o procesamiento de muestras hayan buenas capacidades eh, de microbiología. Hay lugares en algunos países que hemos visto que sí, que, que, que tienen eh, capacidades. En otros lugares hay personas que tienen muy buenas capacidades en biología molecular, pero ni siquiera saben a veces hacer un, un medio de cultivo. Y parece, puede parecer trivial, pero no lo es. Y esto es un proceso también importante. Próximo. Y aquí es algo que, 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 que yo lo digo, que el diagnóstico no es una herramienta. El diagnóstico es un proceso. Y tiene, dependiendo del país, diferentes etapas que son interconectadas. Hay gente que está en campo, colegas, colectando muestras, que es un equipo diferente. Muchas veces el que está en el laboratorio hasta aislar el patógeno, que a veces es un equipo diferente que el que va a hacer el PCR. Y luego aquí que es importante también, hay diferencias entre diagnóstico de rutina, aquello que los laboratorios hacen día a día, muestras que le llegan, miles de muestras, y un diagnóstico que yo, yo lo he puesto aquí como emergencia, donde tú tienes una sospecha de que tienes una plaga cuarentenaria de alto impacto socioeconómico, como es el caso RAS4 tropical. Entonces, yo creo que eh, eh, cuando integras estas partes hay, hay que entender eso muy bien, inclusive los laboratorios cuando hay una, una muestra sospechosa deben probablemente manejar y cambiar su rutina. Tenemos que entender que los laboratorios oficiales de diagnóstico reciben múltiples, múltiples muestras y la mayoría de las veces están sobrecargados. 
Entonces, eh, eh, esos procesos, en lo que he visto en muchos países, es importante que estén bien conectados, que estén armonizados y que se diferencie entre diagnóstico de rutina con un diagnóstico que yo lo he llamado aquí de emergencia. Adelante. Y aquí ya el doctor Quema lo, 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 lo ha dicho. Desde que salió el, el, el método de diagnóstico de MPCR, que es más rápido, en 2010, en, en la mayoría de, los, de, de, los, de esos nuevos reportes ha sido utilizado. Pero eso no quiere decir que los métodos que se usaron anteriormente en, 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 en Australia, en Filipinas, etc., no, no sean válidos, son muy válidos también. A partir de ahí se usan estos métodos y luego han encontrado algunos problemas bueno, Jerkema ya, 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 ya mostró el kit comercial, no hay un diagnóstico que va a durar para siempre, en eso estamos de acuerdo con el doctor Kema también, y hay nuevas, hay nuevas herramientas que, 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 que deben ser también utilizadas. Adelante, por favor. Diferentes papers también, el próximo, no voy a entrar en detalles. Aquí sí es importante, ¿y por qué lo he puesto? Lo, 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 lo habló también James, James, un saludo para ti. Y lo habló también Diane, Diane también un saludo para ti, porque estamos hablando de otras regiones que probablemente están relacionadas con patogenicidad. No ha sido demostrado, pero están relacionadas con patogenicidad. Aquí, por ejemplo, yo he puesto en ese cuadrado en rojo el GEN 68, pero recuerden que James nos habló del GEN 61. Próximo, por favor. Vale, aquí... Aquí yo lo he puesto porque es, esto me han hecho muchísimas preguntas en los últimos tiempos y, y, y aquí es donde se integra y donde podemos, podríamos tener problemas con, con, con cuestiones de conceptos. Porque este artículo trae VCG por un lado, trae razas, pero también trae Genesis. Es un artículo súper eh, interesante, super, eh, pero cuando lo llevamos o lo ponemos al contexto de diagnóstico oficial siempre surgen dudas, porque nuevamente, por un lado está el, lo, la cuestión de los VCG, las razas y el diagnóstico, y yo he puesto esas preguntas ahí, porque sé que ustedes hacen print screen, me pueden hacer preguntas aquí hoy o después, pero hay que tener mucho cuidado cuando lo ponemos en el marco legal, porque hay mucha confusión, porque los VCG no están relacionados con razas, solo en algunos casos, porque esa tecnología no está relacionada con patogenicidad, los N6 ni siempre están demostrados que están relacionados con patogenicidad, y entonces esto, esto nos puede traer una confusión un poco en la cuestión de conceptos. Adelante, por favor. Bueno, más básicamente es eso es lo que seguimos. Todo el mundo lo ha hecho. Si tienes una planta de Cavendish, yo lo he puesto aquí, pero de otra, con síntomas típicos, externos e internos, y haces colecta de muestras, lo llevas a laboratorios, tienes un ADN de calidad súper importante, y tú tienes una PCR, por ejemplo, y he puesto aquí a la derecha sus pantallas, que lo que se sigue en el plan de contingencia de Loisa, que fue ya escrito en 2013. Si eso te da positivo, ya tienes una alerta, porque tienes Cavendish, tienes una epidemia en curso, y tienes una PCR que te está dando positivo. Haces un cross-check, un cross-check porque tienes con diferentes locos. Y aquí me gustaría mucho o, o resaltar el paper de Freddy McDama también, que Diane también lo mencionó, porque Freddy recuperó es, este, eh, eh, esta metodología de Eli y lo puso también y después entró en el, en el proceso en la región de América Latina y Caribe con, con con, en la CAN también, y es otro locus que te, que te está dando. Si tienes esto, y todas estas situaciones, señores, es decisión de la ONPF decir si tiene raza cuadro tropical y no. ¿Por qué es decisión de ellos? Porque hay problemas sociales, políticos y económicos involucrados en cada nueva confirmación. Y las ONPF necesitan su tiempo, necesitan muy bien hacer esos análisis integrados que le dice al principio para poder definir si es o no es. Y luego está la, la, la presión de, de, de la prensa, etcétera, cuando ya se sabe que hay un caso de alerta, hay una sospecha, etcétera. Adelante. Bueno, eso es apenas para mostrarles un poquito de lo que eso se hizo en Perú. En la izquierda de sus pantallas la detección, la segunda el diagnóstico, y el tercero la contención. ¿Por qué estoy poniendo esto? Porque a final de cuentas, el diagnóstico es importante para que para actuar rápido, lo más rápido posible, en contención y evitar, evitar que el patógeno se disemina. Adelante, por favor. Y la pregunta que es, y lo, lo, lo he puesto aquí, inclusive para provocar un poquito, para generar discusión, quizás no ahora o después, 
la pregunta, ¿cómo las ONPF manejan otras enfermedades? Por ejemplo, HLV o eh, la moniliasis de, del cacao. Y la otra parte, poniendo juntos ya la parte de, de diagnóstico oficial y los postulados de Koch, que también se mencionaron varias veces, y las decisiones, eh, eh, digamos, a, a fortalecidas o derivadas en, 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 o condicionadas por la tecnología. Y aquí hay tres preguntas como para discutirlo. ¿Los testes o las pruebas de BCX no son más necesarias? ¿Los, ¿Las pruebas de patogenicidad en el siglo XXI no son más necesarias porque tiene secuenciamiento completo? ¿Y si el secuenciamiento completo ya no es necesario? ¿O sí o no? ¿O si uno y la otra? ¿Es algo para que lo discutamos hoy o para que lo pensemos? Adelante. Aquí para apenas para decirle que también hay varios avances aquí en América Latina y, y el Caribe, en Agrosavia, con el ICA, en Perú, y estamos también buscando eh, entender o, o diagnosticar o eh, detectar en muestras ambientales. Y esto, señores, suelo, agua, no es para hacer diagnóstico oficial, porque recuerden que el patógeno tiene que estar asociado a los síntomas. Sí, es diferente, esto es investigación, esto ayuda a la contención, esto ayuda a la tecnología, pero no es para diagnóstico oficial. Y aquí en, 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 en la región, pues bueno, pues se pueden hacer secuenciamiento también de Illumina, Nanopore, PacBio, etcétera, se están haciendo y se pueden hacer todas estas tecnologías en la región. Adelante. Aquí algo que es importante, inclusive para poner en el pipeline, en pipeline o en el flujo de diagnóstico. ¿Cómo certificamos el material de siembra? Sabemos que es súper importante y aquí hay dos temas. Más temas de inóculo y un tema también de muestreo y lo pongo aquí porque me parece que, que es importante que lo pensemos en el futuro. Inclusive no tanto igual con suelo y agua, pero diagnóstico o certificación, indexación de material de siembra es crítico. Adelante. Y esto también un poco una, provo una, propaga una, una provocación. Raza cuadro tropical, señores, es una enfermedad que tiene más de 30 años, por lo menos. Hacer un diagnóstico rápido de raza cuadro tropical no debería ser un problema hoy para mayoría de los países de, raza cuatro, de, de América Latina y Caribe, pero sabemos que no es así, sabemos que todavía nos falta mucho. Y la otra que lo he, he dicho bastante durante mi presentación es siempre hacer discriminación en cuando estamos haciendo investigación o haciendo diagnóstico para temas epidemiológicos o cuando ese diagnóstico va a resultar en una declaratoria oficial de un país. Es muy diferente decir, sí, hacemos secuenciamiento, hacemos esto o lo otro, o decir, cuando un jefe nacional se para en la prensa y divulga que el patógeno está presente por primera vez en un país o un continente. Eso, eso deriva en, en implicaciones sociales, políticas y económicas, que es muy diferente de un nuevo método cuando se publica. Adelante. Y a mí me parece, ya para concluir un poco, que, que las plataformas regionales para el diagnóstico son muy importantes. Yo no creo, yo no voy a discutir esos cinco puntos que están a la izquierda de sus pantallas, pero a mí me parece que cada vez tenemos que ir más a este tipo de, 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 de estrategias, y no solo pensando en raza tropical, sino fortalecernos, en conectarnos, hacer network con los institutos avanzados de investigación, las universidades, para tener plataformas bien fortalecidas, usando inteligencia artificial, etcétera, o por ejemplo, inclusive plataformas, integradas a plataformas de vigilancia, como es el caso, por ejemplo, de Pest Displays, que, que, que lo tenemos nosotros en la Alianza Biodiversity International CIAT. Adelante. Casi concluyendo, eh, eh, agradecer a los colegas de, en Colombia y en Perú que están trabajando fuertemente en la contención de raza cuadra tropical en la región. Adelante. Y también a todos los que han trabajado eh, de una manera u otra y, y hemos colaborado. Y aquí me gustaría resaltar un poco la, 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 el apoyo también de la Universidad de Wageningen, porque antes los kits, etcétera, nos apoyaron muchísimo en el, todo el proceso de fortalecimiento de capacidades en la región. Adelante. Y luego mandarle un apoyo fuertísimo a los colegas que están hoy en pie de combate de, haciéndole frente a raza cuadra tropical en todas las partes del mundo junto con la epidemia de COVID. Muchos se han contaminado y, 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 y no es, no, no es una, una situación muy fácil, pero sabemos que un día van a reconocer ya es, ese trabajo que están realizando porque las situaciones de hoy enfrentando el COVID no, no son realmente fáciles. Adelante. Y con esto ya decirle gracias por su atención. Ahí tienen mi email y también me puede contactar por otras vías, otras plataformas. Gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dita, for your presentation, and of course, um, showing linkages between the diagnostics process and that of the response 
with um, national plant protection organizations. We will move on to Dr. Um, Jung Peng from the from the Chinese Academy of Tropical Agriculture Science, and he will um, present his he will do his presentation right now. Go ahead, Dr. Pen. The, the floor is yours. Okay. It's my it's my pleasure here to give a presentation about the Balala Fusarium Wild Tropical Risk for Detection and Controlling Strategy in China. I will next slide. Next slide. Please next slide. Yeah. Yeah. I will report in the following order. First, brief, briefly introduce the occurrence and the distribution of TR4 in China. And secondly, the TR4 detection method widely used in China. Finally, is how to control the few larum uh, of Belala in China. Next slide, thanks. First, I will introduce the occurrence and the distribution of TR4 in China. Next. Next slide. Yeah. TR4 was the first identified in China is Guangdong province at 2001, which caused by TR4. At present, the TR4 is all of Balala producing plantation in the China. Next, next slide. Next slide, yeah. As we know, Fusarium built of Balala caused by Fusarium older reticimum, which caused typical symptoms in China, such as leaf yellowing, Pseudo stem splitting, vascular discoloration, and rhizome necrosis. Yeah, okay, slide. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. Yeah. At present, no, effect, no effective measures for controlling TR4 once infected in the field and the low resistance cultivars is low in Musa against the TR4. So, Annual and accurate detection of TR4 is essential to protect Balala industry and guide Balala planting. This photo is from the Yunnan province, China. The TR4 can cause a huge economic uh, losses in plantation. Next slide, thanks. Uh, in this part, I will introduce the um, developed lamp method used for quantitative and quantitative detection of TR4 in infected plants and soil sample. Although many techniques and uh, methods available for um, TR4 in China, the most used is lamp method because uh, the beast DNA polymerase can confer the higher tolerance to inhibitory substrate of soil sample. Okay, next, next slide, thanks. This is a progress of lamp detection. First is the DNA extracted and then is a cycling amplification and the fellow is uh, the result judgment. Next slide, thanks. Yeah. Next, next slide. Yeah. The lamp employed 
employed a beast in a polymerase and a set of four specially designed primers that recognize a total of six distinct sequence on the target DNA. The out primer F3 and B3 each re recognized one of six, six sites and the prime amplification of the entire region in a long cycling manner. This is this slide show you the prime design and the and the next slide will show you how to work use this primer. Next slide, thanks. Okay, next slide. Yeah. The beast DNA polymerase with the strength dis displacement activity, the inner primer each recognize two of the six sites within the amplified sequence and form a dumpling like DNA structure used for subsequently cycling amplification. Within one hour, the cycling amplification can get uh, accumulation at uh, the life the, the life power of 10 copies of the target DNA. Next slide, thanks. How to uh, how to judge the judge the detection results first with the lump reaction the byproduct with white precipitate will be viewed and the view next okay next slide next the lump products can also be viewed with axos, axos gel electrophoresis. The cyber green stain is another approach can viewed by leak eyes. The positive samples will turn green after staining, but the negative samples remain orange. Next slide, since. Green stain. Uh, apart from the quality, qualitative assay, the real time fluorescence loop mediated as a thermal amplification can rapid and quantitative detection the samples. This is a real time tabidimeter and the, the amplicave according to the turbidity. So the real ample can use the for quantitative detection from the, from the infected plant and the soil and the water samples. Next slide, thanks. Next slide, next, next slide. Yeah, this slide show, we use the lamp method to detection RIS4, R4, and the tropical RIS4 in China, respectively. Uh, this is the two paper we have published. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. Yeah. First, is a prime design. For the TR4 prime lamp prime design, the back back to back to back to one more. Yeah. Uh, for TR4 um, lamp prime design, prime design, the IGS region is available for TR4 lamp primer design, but for us for uh, primer, a specific rapid mark sequence 
used for the primary design and the next next slide. Next slide, things. Yeah, next slide. This slide show the prime sequence and the relative position in the Jilu are indicated by the arrows. The left is TR4 primer and the right is R4 uh, primer. Okay, next slide, thanks. For the specific specificity test the lamp products or applicants only from tr4 dna and the next is tr4 specific pcr and then is cyber green staining fellow is a, a application cave this result can indicate can prove that the designed primer is a TR4 specific. The R4 specific test is as same as TR4 specific test. So the result can or indicate or indicated that the primer is specific to each one. Thanks. Next slide. The detection limit of real ample is about four times of about about four times of ten to the power of minus four nanogram per microliter, which is lower than real time PCR. Okay, next slide. For the feasibility test, we you we the TR4 pure pure spores and the pure spore mixed with soil were detection with real lamp and real time PCR respectively. We can show from the the result show result shown. The sensitivity of real um, real ample is not changed after the spore mixed with soil, but the sensitivity of the real time pizza is reduced after the spore mixed with soil. This okay. Stop. This result indicated that the BST DNA polymerase confer this reaction high, highly tolerant to inhibitory substrates from the soil samples. Yes. And this slide show we successfully using lamp method detection TR4 in the soil samples. Okay, next slide. Hmm. This slide shows the, com uh, the comparison between lamp and the PCR from the result we, sh we can figure out. Lamp <clears throat> is a simple, rapid, and effective method compared with the PCR method. Okay, next slide. In this part, we will introduce how to control the TR4 in China. The main measure is using the resistant cultivars and the supplementary measure is biological control in the field a very important supporting measure is strength field management, especially 
especially precise water and the fertilizer management. Management. Okay, next slide, thanks. Now, there are many resistant cultivars used in Thailand, but the most widely planted is Bao Dao Balala cultivar, which characterized with red pseudo stems and the red bars. Another resistance cultivars is Nan Tian Huang Balala cultivar, which characterized with cane stems and cane bars. The two cultivars is planted in Thailand, is the most popular. Okay, next slide. Okay, next. Oh, okay. This picture show the field performance of resistant cultivar Lan Tian Huang. From the picture, we can figure out this cultivars confer resistant or tolerant to TR4 in the field. Okay, next slide, thanks. Hmm. Dr. And, Pen, excuse me, Dr. Pen. Um, yes. We we are we are going beyond um, the assigned time for the webinar. Um, would you be able to end your presentation within the next um, couple of moments, please? Uh, one one minute more is okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, another another method is biological control, the usual bio control agents with uh, anti fungi activity, promote blood growth or enhance resistance to TR4. Multi, multiple agents can co fermentation and applied in field, which will Effective, effective. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. Okay. Well, effective reduce the disease incidence. Okay, next slide, thanks. Yes, and the, the fellow slide showing the precise, precise water and the fertilizer management Ingrid, integration of water and the fertilizer in one water piping. You can see the picture, one spring belt and the two drip tubes in each plane lines, make light. The two pictures showing the mechanized the Balala plantation construction, and the third picture shows the field secondary co-fermentation fermentation technology of liquid bioorganic bacterial manure. Okay, sorry for the time limit. Many works have a lot to share to everyone. Maybe next time we have the opportunity. Thanks for your attention. This is the external view of our building of environments and the Plant Protecting Institute. Welcome to Thailand, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Penn, for your presentation. As I mentioned, we, we are sort of going, we have gone beyond the allotted time for, for a webinar, um, but thank you very much for your presentation and sharing the information um, on Katas and its and its work. Thank you very much.
um, we, we have a slight change to our agenda. We will invite um, for some brief comments, um, Dr. or Mr. Mauricio Guzman, um, who will share a few words with us, and then we'll go on to Mr. Prather, the Secretary of the World Banner Forum, and um, he will give closing remarks. Mr. Guzman, the floor is yours. Uh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. ¿Me escucha bien, Nelson? Sí, te escucho muy bien. Gracias por la oportunidad. Voy a, voy a, a hablar en español porque hay traducción y tenemos también mucha gente que habla en español y es además lo que hago mejor. <laughs> eh, primero, a felicitar a FAO y también al World Banana Forum por esta actividad que ha sido sumamente eh, buena y por supuesto a todos los conferencistas por compartir sus experiencias y todos sus, sus resultados que son sumamente valiosos. Yo quería comentar algo que quizás es más un comentario que una pregunta, pero podrían algunos de los participantes, de los conferencistas, referirse a ello. Y es sobre el diagnóstico de campo, porque quedó muy claro todos los procesos para el diagnóstico de laboratorio, el análisis molecular, la colecta de muestras. Sin embargo, si nos vamos a los casos de Colombia y de Perú, las más recientes este, apariciones de R4T, y analizamos el caso en mayor profundidad, nos damos cuenta que ambas tienen algo en común. Y es que fueron realizados, eh, los diagnósticos de campo fueron mal realizados y fueron realizados tardíamente. En el caso de Colombia, se confundió con moco, de hecho le llamaban moco negro a esa patología que observaban en el campo. Al final, este, se determinó que era R4T. Y en el caso de Perú, si, si revisan también un poco la historia, van a encontrar que desde el año 2016-2017 se venían presentando casos de falso mal de Panamá. Y cuando realmente ahora se revisa el caso, la enfermedad está muy distribuida, es decir, están ahí en ambos casos desde hace mucho tiempo. O sea que estamos fallando un aspecto clave, que es el diagnóstico de campo. Y ahí ocupamos, por supuesto, mayor fortalezas, aumentar las capacidades de los países y de los grupos de trabajo en este aspecto. Porque de lo contrario, aunque el diagnóstico de laboratorio sea tan bueno como lo tenemos ahora, porque realmente, si me voy a las preguntas que hizo el doctor de al final, comparto muchas de las respuestas ahí, en el sentido de que ya casi con diagnósticos directos moleculares tenemos una gran herramienta para poder decir que sí, pero si eso está aunado a un diagnóstico de campo bien hecho por personal capacitado, yo estaría muy seguro de dar un veredicto. Casi que esto... Respondiendo un poco, Miguel, a tu pregunta o, o, al, o, al, o al comentario que lanzaste en el sentido de que de qué manera podríamos o si podríamos usar el diagnóstico de laboratorio directo, del diagnóstico molecular para decir si hay o no R4T. En eso yo estaría de acuerdo solamente si el diagnóstico de campo fue realizado adecuadamente, porque eso es clave y es donde creo que estamos, este, tenemos una debilidad importante y quizás FAO puede retomar ese tema para un futuro eh, webinar. Muchas gracias por la, por la oportunidad, Nelson, y también a Víctor. Gracias um, por sus palabras, gracias. Um, ahorita vamos con el señor um, Víctor Prada. Víctor, you have the floor. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Voy a hablar en castellano porque también es, es mi lengua. Uh, primero, darle las gracias a nuestros destacados panelistas por estas intervenciones que nos han dado tanta claridad y tanta información necesaria. Hace muchos meses que, eh, mientras preparamos la, la red global de NR4T, que escuchamos que el tema del diagnóstico es un tema importante, en ocasiones controversial y que requería su tiempo. Entonces, este es el motivo para hacer este primer webinario. Continuaremos con estos webinarios para dar más información y sobre todo en diagnóstico, porque hay tantas cosas que debemos tratar para, con respecto al, al Fusarium que, que tenemos que separarlo en varias secciones, pero mmm, me doy cuenta de que tenemos que volver a este tema. Eh, seguramente será para septiembre o principios de octubre. Y eh, bueno, para seguir alimentando esta 
red global de la FAO en, en R4T que pretende ser ese punto eh, neurálgico, neutral para darles información y, y que podamos compartir cuáles son las mejores prácticas. Entonces esperamos también que toda esta información haya sido muy útil para todos los participantes de la reunión de hoy y eh, como saben el, 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 nuestro, el mandato de la FAO es que eh, establezcamos estas eh, conexiones entre distintos actores que trabajan quizás con distintas metodologías o distintas iniciativas para que podamos eh, evaluar cómo podemos colaborar. Así que creo que este ha sido un buen eh, webinario, la información ha sido muy útil, pero no, eh, no quita para que tengamos otros webinarios y como saben todos ustedes probablemente la semana que viene tenemos eh, tres días de webinarios más largos que el de hoy, el de hoy ha sido de dos horas y soy consciente de que tenemos además interpretación que está contratada hasta hace unos minutos, así que muchas gracias a la intérprete por la ayuda, la excelente interpretación y por el tiempo extra que está dedicando. Eh, y únicamente quiero unos minutos para recordarles que la semana que viene, días 27, 28 y 29, seguimos con las jornadas de la FAO con respecto al fortalecimiento de capacidades y sensibiliz sensibilización en respuesta a la amenaza de la marchitez por fusario entre banano el R4T. Así que este proyecto, como saben, es parte de las actividades del proyecto de emergencia de la FAO en América Latina y el Caribe, eh, capitaneado por, por Raisa Jauger y, y Esther Peralta, y eh, en colaboración con el, el IPPC, el, la, la Plataforma Internacional para la Protección Vegetal, y el, el Foro Mundial Bananero. Entonces, estas sesiones que tendremos la semana que viene, días, repito, 27, 28 y 29, de 4 de la tarde a 7 y media hora Italia, 8 de la mañana a 11 y media hora Costa Rica, 9 de la mañana a 12 y media hora Ecuador, eh, se basarán principalmente el martes 27 en el contexto actual, dónde estamos, cómo está el, el tema del riesgo y el impacto y, y la comunicación al respecto, porque también es necesario que todos podamos colaborar para que no suceda lo que comentaba don Mauricio o comentaban anteriores panelistas, ¿no? esta falta de desinformación o de, o de acción rápida. Entonces, eso se va a tratar el día 27, les invito a todos a participar. El 28 trataremos temas de bioseguridad y aplicaciones móviles que apoyan a la vigilancia, imágenes satelitares, drones, etcétera, cómo podemos facilitar esas actividades. Y el jueves 29 de julio, alternativas de manejo, que incluye prácticas agrícolas, eh, clones promisorios y procedimientos para su introducción, básicamente. Hay, hay una agenda completa que ya está disponible en nuestra página web. Les acabo de compartir la página web en, en el... En, ah, lo ha puesto aquí también mi compañero Mateus. Eh, toda esta información está disponible tanto en la página web del Foro Mundial Bananero como de la red global de R4T y eh, actualizaremos todos los panelistas en el día de hoy y el de mañana eh, porque faltaba algún panelista por confirmar pero por lo menos todas las áreas temáticas han sido cerradas y la agenda está disponible para todos ustedes así que sin más dilación muchas gracias por su tiempo y espero hayan encontrado la información compartida hoy de utilidad para sus actividades. Y de nuevo, muchísimas gracias tanto al intérprete como al chair, al señor Lavile, a, Mar, a Mateus por, por la colaboración para temas logísticos y con la plataforma y sobre todo a nuestros panelistas que han dedicado el tiempo a, para compartir todo ese conocimiento con nosotros. Así que muchas gracias por la información y que pasen ustedes un buen día.